G'day guys, it's the coach here. And in this video, I'm going to share with you my top six questions that I ask each and every opponent when I play a game of Age of Sigma. The reason I'm sharing these six questions is that they aren't the only questions that I ask. And I'm sure you have questions that you ask all the time. However, through consistency, I'm able to make better gaming decisions. And because we all have different experiences in Age of Sigma and we all want something different from this game, it's important for me to understand my opponent before we start rolling dice and before we start putting down uh, our models so that we can have a good experience overall. Not only do I want to win, but I also want to have a great time. So these six questions are the questions that I ask every opponent, but not necessarily the only questions that I ask. So I better tell you what those six questions are. The first one I ask is an open-ended question. That is, what do I need to know about your army? Now, the reason it's an open-ended question is because my opponent can't just say yes or no. What they will do is they will tell me a bunch of information. Some will tell me more than others, but ultimately they will provide me a lot of information that I can use either for deployment or during the game. It might tell me what I need to avoid or what I need to target. Really, that may start the conversation and hopefully we can build some rapport along the way. Now, your opponent may actually even share with you and they might ask you a question in return and say, well, have you played this army before? And it's interesting because when you start playing an army, let's say you've played Cities of Sigma in the past. The Cities of Sigma build in Tempest Eye is a little bit different to Hallow Heart and it might be a little bit different to Hammer Hall. So by understanding what you've experienced in the past will determine how much they want to share with you and maybe what you need to know. So uh, I really like that question. What do you need to know about my army? The second question, and this is not necessarily in chron chronological order, but they are questions that I like to ask. The second question I always want to know about is how many drops does your army have? Now, a drop is the amount of units they can put down as a deployment. Now, as you may know, with a, a battalion, a battalion can change the amount of drops that the, the person has. So even though they might have 11 units on their army list, if they have a battalion and the battalion captures five or six of them, it does mean that they can reduce the amount of drops. This is important for me to understand how I need to deploy. If I know that my opponent is going to outdrop me, what that might mean is I need to start thinking about, do I need to play more conservative or do I need to play more aggressive? Do I put my units on the, the, the closest part of the, the deployment zone or do I hide them back because maybe my opponent is likely to take the first turn and charge me? A prime example of your Iron Jaws or your Beast Claw Raiders. Equivalently, you might find that uh, an opponent is likely to give you the first go or maybe you get to make the choice. So understanding how many drops your opponent is can be really important to make better decisions in deployment. And if you know that you have more drops than your opponent, it does mean that you could actually be putting down your not so strong units and trying to work out where your opponent's putting their strongest pieces so you can counter them. So how many drops is your army is important, especially for deployment and trying to determine who goes first. The next question I ask, the question number three, is what does your allegiance, sub-allegiance and battalion do? So I mentioned Cities of Sigma before. You may have played Cities of Sigma, but have you played Hallow Heart? Do you know how the, the battalions work? And the, depending on the sub-allegiance, so it might be a temple, whether it's a city, whether it's a tribe, whether it is a skyport, depending on uh, who you're playing and, and, and the types of builds, um, they're all called different things, but I like to use catch-all of, of, of sub-allegiance. Uh, the sub-allegiance will tell you the different rules and maybe it'll make certain units better, stronger, faster, cheaper. Um, so keep that in mind when it comes to your, your sub-allegiance. It also will tell you your battalion. Now, a lot of these things like your allegiance, your sub-allegiance and your battalion, these rules aren't, aren't normally freely available in things like your uh, AOS mobile app. They're usually hidden in things, something like a battle tome. So uh, by getting that out early, uh, it allows you to get a bit more, better understanding of your opponent. And it does mean that, you know, when you're looking up, let's say, a witch elf, uh, you can put a little bit of context around that while the rules, the extra rules aren't on the Witch of War Scroll, they might be on the Hagnar rules in the book. So keep that in mind. 
The next question I like to ask about, and this one for me is a really important one because it does potentially, it's called an I gotcha moment where you may not know something and it's like, oh, I gotcha. And the question I like to ask, and you can change the question however you want, but I want to know if my opponent has movement shenanigans. Now, I like to use that as a catch-all, but you could ask them, do you have any special movement? Do you have any movement that is considered normal? And when you think about movement, whether it's in the game or before the game, in deployment, for example, you know, some, some opponents can keep their units in the side, keep it in reserve, keep it in the, um, the side of the board, and they could bring it on later. A prime example of that could be something like a Shadow Warrior, where instead of deploying Shadow Warriors in uh, on the tabletop, you could put them in reserve and bring them in during the game. Um, the Assassin in Cities of Sigma hides in a unit, uh, and it can be any unit, while a Goblin Fanatic, the Loon Smasher Fanatic, will hide in a, a, a unit of Goblins. However, you need to write it down. So, you know, there's a difference even between the assassin versus the, uh, the, 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 the loon smashers. On the flip side, you then have things like Flesh Eater Courts or even like Flesh Eater Courts is just one example. Living City and Cities is another one. There are more examples of these where you can bring in units from the side of the board so long there is whether in six or nine inches of a table edge. Um, Stormcast can deploy uh, a unit in reserve for every unit that's on the, t on the, the battlefield. Um, you've got things like your Canine Shadow Stalkers that what, what, when they're on the table, uh, they can sacrifice their movement to teleport. Uh, tree Revenants are exactly the same. Uh, at the same time, you've got things like uh, Gloom Spike Kits with something called the Hand of Gork that allows you to teleport a unit uh, as long as they, they kind of end, the, end on the tabletop outside of nine inches. So I've just shown you a couple examples of where you may not ask your opponent, can you teleport? Can you put them in reserve? Are you hiding things? But trying to understand overall, do you have any special movement either in deployment or during the game can be very important for you to understand how you make better decisions, how you may deploy, how you may interact with your opponent. So keep that one in mind, shenanigans, movement, whatever you want to call it. The fifth question I like to ask my opponent is, what are your primary threat ranges? Now, threat ranges can be a combination of things. Uh, to give you an example, you know, um, a Hurricanum, a Celestial Hurricanum, it may move 12 inches or 10 inches. However, it does have a shooting attack as well. And let's say that shooting attack is 18 inches. The threat range of that Hurricanum isn't 18 inches. It's the combined characteristic of movement and shooting. It could be movement and running and charging. And there are units that allow you to run and charge. It could be the, the threat range of a, un a spells unbind. Trying to understand what your opponent's threat ranges are can be very, very important. Um, if you've got an opponent like an Iron Jaws or a uh, Beast Claw Raiders, again, these are two very traditional fast armies. Uh, Corn is another one. Um, even Nurgle, even Nurgle with their Feculent Nam or Terrain Piece, they're able to run and charge so long as they're within, uh, is it seven inches of a Feculent Nam all? So understanding that, yes, their movement characteristic may be five. But when you then potentially put the potential of a command point or moving up to six inches on a run and then the potential charge of a 2d6 and maybe they get plus one, plus two, plus three to their charge roll, all of a sudden that threat range is much larger than when you just consider their movement characteristic alone. So that can be important, especially, uh, as I mentioned, those, those charging armies. Uh, you will get caught off guard at least once when an opponent charges you in the first turn and you're like, oh, how did you get there early? And something to consider. The last one, and I like to call this more like social type questions, is actually it's kind of like a two-parter. The first one is, do you count your wounds up or down? Now that's important because when you are working with things like behemoths, you, let's say behemoth has 12 wounds or 14 wounds. You know, when you start seeing that dice or that wound characteristic during the game, it's easy to forget if the opponent has uh, seven wounds remaining or it has taken seven wounds. So is it at half strength? Is it below strength? Uh, where is it fighting on its brackets? Now, some people like to match that wound characteristic to their behemoth chart to make it easy to see how they're attacking. But at the same time, there are some people who like just to track 
how many wounds are remaining. So to avoid any uh, miscommunication, any th thoughts of potential cheating, I always like to ask early on, how do you track your wounds? I always track up. So just to kind of keep on the, the same page as the, the behemoth chart. And then the other part of that, which is another social contract question, which is almost like a bonus question, is how do you treat dice rolls, especially when they aren't flat? Now, when you roll dice and they come near a terrain piece or sometimes next to a model, sometimes they aren't flat. And I like to have with my opponent that I like to re-roll those dice. If it's not flat, um, I like to re-roll it, whether it was a success or a not success. Um, I like to say very much upfront, the dice wasn't flat, let's re-roll it. But just having that type of um, conversation upfront early, again, helps with the social contract that you have with your, your opponent. Now, I mentioned earlier that these aren't the only questions you might want to ask. I like to ask questions, things like, can I have a copy of your army sheet? Especially when I'm at a tournament, I might ask that uh, unless I have a copy of it already. Uh, but when I'm at a local gaming store, I probably won't have a copy of the army. Most people don't print off their army. They might have it on their phone, but normally they might won't have it printed off. You might want to ask, you know, can you run and charge, especially if I'm facing a, a very combat focused army? Uh, but if I'm fighting KO, for example, I probably wouldn't ask about run and charge. So um, there are certain questions you'll ask certain armies, things like how many um, how many command points do you start with? Um, you know, things like, you know, how many spells can you cast? Um, how many pluses can you, can you add to your casting role? You know, looking at some of the endless spells, tell me about the endless spells. You know, in some of the the battle plans that require you or give you bonus points for having uh, a leader or a behemoth or a battle line in range, I might want to ask which ones are your leaders, your battle lines, your behemoths. Um, and then even if my opponent has special dice, I might ask them, is that special dice characteristic? And, you know, sometimes it, they're, they're a symbol. Uh, is that symbol representing of a one or a six? Again, you know, just so when I'm looking at their dice and looking at what they roll, I'm clear that that skull equals a six or that um, that army symbol is a six or it's a one. Uh, you know, you can't really have both sides of the coin. They're my six questions, and I've given you a couple of bonus questions. I would love to hear from you what questions you ask your opponents, and are there ones that you ask all of your opponents, or are you asking situational questions depending on the battle plan, depending on your army? Obviously, I like to ask rapport questions like how's your day, how long have you been playing with his army for, um, what do you know about my army? And, you know, through that, I, I hopefully we have better gaming experiences and you know, we have some consistency in the types of questions you ask so that you can make better gaming decisions on the day. Please let me know in the comments section what questions you're asking. And I hope those top six questions that I ask will be helpful to you when you meet an opponent for the first time or you roll dice with your next opponent. I hope you found that discussion valuable. If you did, give the video the old thumbs up. And if you have a comment or an insight, leave it in the comment section below. The champions over here are my AOS Coach Patreons and YouTube members. So you guys are bloody legends. Thank you for all the support. If you want to know more about the support programs, the links are below down here in the episode description, along with the link to the Discord server, so we can continue this conversation. Until next time, don't forget to name your characters and have a good one.